Hi, folks. Well, welcome to the July session of Power BI Office Hours. Hope everybody's uh, doing well. Uh, can't believe we are already at the end of July. So <laughs> this year is flying by. Um, so uh, we're going to uh, get started here. Um, uh, so as, just as a reminder, um, today's session is being recorded. So uh, if you do not want to be on a recorded call, um, uh, now would be the time to uh, exit. We do, and we do make these sessions available um, to everybody. Uh, uh, there's a link here in a minute where you can go back and view um, uh, previous recordings. Also, um, at, at the we we reserve the last half of this session for your questions. So, um, if you do have questions, go ahead and just throw those in the chat window really quick. Um, and we will get to those questions uh, at the end of the day here in a minute. Um, but before we start, I would love to um, uh, just have you guys add, answer a couple of poll questions for us, if you would. So the first one just is, um, what level of experience do you have with Power BI? Awesome, great, thanks. And then secondly, just what industry do you work in? Great, okay, thank you very much, appreciate that. Just helps me kind of tailor the presentation a little bit uh, to to meet the, the uh, folks that we have on the call. Let's see if I can get my PowerPoint to work here. So um, again, my name is Eric Lofstrom. Uh, I work with Blue Granite. Um, uh, I do. I specialize in the Microsoft Business Intelligence platform. So um, do a lot of uh, Power BI development, a lot of Power BI training. Um, so if you're interested in any of that, uh, check out that link there at the bottom. Um, and again, that's the, the, the Power BI Office Hours 2018 is the link to get to uh, prior versions of this, uh, or prior sessions, beg your pardon, of Power BI Office Hours, so you're welcome to go check those out. Um, just one note to any of the folks on the call that might be using Power BI Report Server. Um, a lot of the features I'm going to be showing you uh, today probably don't apply to you. Your, your desktop client is on a different release schedule than uh, the, the Say the standard client. So just be aware that some of the things that I'm showing today you may not have available to you right at this moment. Okay, so the plan for today uh, is we're going to take a look at the new features of the July release. Um, and then uh, I'll demo a few of those features. We, got, we have a fun demo today, so I think you're going to uh, in, enjoy it. Uh, it's kind of funny. And then um, uh, I've got a use case that we're going to talk about um, focusing on fiscal calendars. So a lot of times when I'm teaching class, uh, I'll get questions about, hey, our fiscal year starts in October. How do we do that? So I'm going to show you guys that and some fun facts on how to handle fiscal calendars. And then we'll open it up to your questions. So uh, again, just use that chat window um, to ask any questions. I'll try to keep an eye on it as best I can. Um, and then we'll just kind of kind of go from there. Okay. So the new uh, features that we, we uh, saw this month, um, I think the release dropped July 9th, I believe, give or take a day. Um, but uh, we've got some fun new reporting things, including icon sets in our tables and matrices. So I'm going to show you those. Uh, that'll be a fun one. Uh, we also have um, in the conditional formatting by rules, uh, we can now specify either a number or a percent. So I'll show you that. Um, and the new filter pane experience is now generally available, so it's no longer a preview feature. Uh, and I'll show you that one as well. Um, some other fun reporting things. Um, we've got some data color support. If any of you have used the play axis on that scatter chart, um, we've got some fun data color support there, as well as some performance improvements on some of the, uh, the slicers that we have in the tool. 
On the analytics side, uh, they continue to improve this key influencers visual. I think we took a look at that maybe two or three months ago. Uh, so you can check out that recording. Uh, and I misspelled aggregations. That's always embarrassing. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, but uh, if you're if you are a uh, if you're leveraging the uh, aggregation feature, which is a, a process and performance and optimization feature, uh, we've got some good improvements there, including support for low level security. Uh, we've got some fun new custom visualizations that have been released. Uh, so if you've ever used the Power Apps visual, um, that's that's been added to the certified list. Uh, I've used that a couple of times. That's what I used to uh, add the ability to add comments. Um, there's a fun uh, uh, walkthrough out there by Jason Thomas uh, that shows you how you can use Power Apps to give your users the ability to add comments right in a Power BI report. So that's kind of cool. Uh, this sunburst, I'll show you that uh, just because I thought it was kind of neat. Um, and then the flying brick visual, I haven't really played with that, but uh, my understanding is the flying brick visual is makes waterfall charts a lot easier. Uh, but I haven't played with it yet, so um, see if I can get get some experience on that one. No. Lastly, uh, some on the data prep side in, in the query editor. We've got the ability to now split column by positions, very similar to if you're doing fixed width files, and essentially you just add a common delimited list of the, the, the zero base index location of where you want to split the column. So super handy. This way we didn't have to do 15 different extract first X number of uh, characters kind of thing. So it just makes, makes our uh, uh, M code a little nicer. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and then a couple of, of connectors coming out, um, Azure Data Lake Store Gen 2, if you use any of that, um, Cosmos DB is generally available. So some fun data connectivity uh, uh, improvements there as well. So um, always uh, a challenge to keep up with. They, they, they spit out so many new features. <laughs> it's a full-time job just keeping up with it all. So. Um, so yeah, so those, those are some of the, the, the fun uh, new features that we had coming out here in July. Uh, but I want to take a look at a couple here to show you guys. Um, so we're going to look at these icon sets, which is a fun new conditional formatting feature. Uh, so I'll show you that. I'm going to show you the uh, new filter pane experience. If you haven't, if you haven't checked that out, um, you can also format that. And then there was a there was a, a feature last month called the Visual Header Tooltip that I didn't demo. That uh, I, I think it's worth me showing you guys how to turn that on because I do think it's going to uh, be useful um, as we're trying to make our reports more intuitive to our end users. So I'll show you that, uh, and then we'll look at the the Sunburst chart as well. So those are some of the features we're going to take a look at today, and then we'll get into our uh, our use case. All right, so. Uh, here we are in Power BI. This is that new sunburst visual. So it's kind of cool. Um, you know, here I'm just kind of looking at my product category and subcategory. It has some neat features where if you click on one, it'll give you the, the percentage here in the middle of the total as you're looking at it. So kind of a neat little visual. Um, I, I did find that if I tried to get too granular, like if I tried to put the actual product numbers in this, it seemed it, it would hang for about 15 seconds or so and then just give me an error saying there's too many values. So um, just be aware that it, it doesn't feel like you can throw, you know, like 10,000 values at this thing. Um, so hopefully they, they will update it where it'll inherit my the formatting on my measures. Notice here I'm, I'm not getting uh, I'm not getting the dollar sign or the thousand separates and that sort of thing. So hopefully they'll, they'll add that in uh, to inherit the, the formatting of the underlying calculated measure that is in here. But um, so anyway, uh, so that's the sunburst chart. Um, this here is the new filter pane. So uh, if you haven't seen it before, now for, for um, PBX files created prior to June, um, you'll, I think you'll still need to toggle this one on. But by default, this new filter experience is now uh, enabled. So your filters no longer are found in the visualizations pane. They're in their own pane out here. Um, so, you know, for example, I can come in and if I want to apply a visual level filter, that's these here at the top. 
um, I can just simply come in and say, you know, I just drag it here and then select which one I want. So uh, I, this is really meant to mimic what the filter pane looks like in PowerBI.com. Uh, so that's why they've moved it out here into its own pane. Uh, you can also format this if I get to, so I've, I've deselected everything so I can come to the, essentially the format tab of the page. And here is where I can specify, like if I really want my format, you know, to, my filter pane to have this green background color, you can do fun things like that. Uh, you can specify diff, different formatting things like you can format the cards to say, you know, I want, uh, I want this color border and you know, this color if it's uh, selected, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got some fun fil uh, formatting capabilities here in this new filter pane uh, to really, so if, if you've got, you know, if you've applied a really specific theme maybe to your report and you want the filter pane to match that theme, you can, uh, you can format it to match that. So, uh, so I thought that was a pretty, uh, pretty nice improvement. Again, that's now generally available. Uh, so you don't have to turn on that preview feature to see that. So that's the new filter pane there. Uh, let's take a look at, um, let's, let's look at the visual, uh, uh, tooltip. So what it is, is this little clutch. It's, I don't know if you can see when it's turned on, you get this little question mark in the header of each individual visualization. Okay. How did I turn that on? So where you set that is in the format tab. Uh, the first thing you have to do is under visual header, you need to scroll all the way down and turn on this visual header tooltip icon, which is off by default. When you turn that on, you then get this visual header tooltip option, which allows you to either type in a set of text, which is what I did here. I found it very interesting to see where it chose to put in the character turns in this single line of text. Um, or you can, much like you have a tooltip page, so I just created a little tooltip page with a Hello World box on it, where if you really want something formatted, you can do something like that. So the, the, the report page tooltip in the visual header tooltip works just like a report page tooltip in any other visualization. Uh, so this is really handy, you know, if, if you want your users to, what am I looking at here? They could come over and just hover over this icon and you can give them, you know, some highly formatted stuff. Or again, uh, you can just, if you set the report page to none and you just give it the tooltip text, this now, you get something like that. So that's that visual uh, header tooltip, which I think uh, I find pretty, I think this is going to be a neat way to, uh, really help our users understand what's going on in our reports. All right, lastly, let's have some fun with icon sets. Uh, so uh, I, I had a lot of fun uh, last night uh, prepping for this demo. So uh, much like uh, in, under conditional formatting, which by the way, you can get to via just right clicking on one of the fields in the shelf, um, so but the same way we can, we've, we've done background colors, font colors, and data bars for forever, but we now have this option to come in and select icons. And so you can set your icons, if it, there it goes, uh, the same way you set any other uh, uh, conditional formatting. So here I can do it by rules. Notice that, remember I said we had that support now for percent and a number. So this is, here's the, it's defaulting to a percent. I kind of wish it would stay defaulted to number, but that's just me. Uh, but if I, can, if I can just come in and change these to numbers and I'll say, you know, from my minimum value to, and let's go with, uh, I don't know, 20 million maybe. One, two, three. We might, and there's that icon. And then maybe I go from 20 million to, oh, let's say 300 million. One, two, three, one, two, three. Oh, and I need to make these numbers, not uh, percents. Make that yellow. And then lastly, we'll say greater than 300 million and less than my max. If it's not obvious, if you want to get the minimum and maximum, you just remove the value. 
so, and it'll default to either minimum in the left-hand box or, or maximum in the right-hand box. All right, and we'll just click OK. And there's my icon. That's kind of fun. Um, but interestingly, uh, so, and you can, there's a whole palette of icons in there. So if I come back to my icons, you've got all sorts of different icons that you can pick here. All right, so you can get flags, stars, whatever you want. You can also, uh, if you want to specify, so these icon sets support GIFs, which I thought was really, they also support SVG graphics which I thought was really kind of interesting. So for example, um, I've created this little uh, product category percent of grand total icon measure. This is just a measure. And notice it's just saying if it's less than this, and this is using SVG graphics. I think we did a Harvey office, office hours talking about SVG spark lines uh, some months ago. It also allows you to just specify a particular icon in the palette or you can actually specify GIFs, which I thought was really <laughs> kind of funny. Um, so uh, if this, this Giffer.com is just one uh, that allows you to you know, point to an, an online GIF. Just FYI, there is definitely some not safe for work uh, content on Giffer.com, so just be careful there uh, when you're going out there. Um, but with this now, this icon, that I've created just saying if you know if it's less than this then do this etc uh, if I come in now to percent of grand total and say conditional formatting I come to my icon and instead of by rules I can say do it by a field value and I can say base that on I just need to go find that percent of grand total icon there it is this guy here and I'll just hit okay and notice what I get now we had all sorts of fun things here. So, so this is the SVG graphic that I, I built. This is another one here. And here are, can you see that these guys are moving? So my, my, my flames or my little psychedelic spinner here. So you can really have uh, some fun with that. Um, and in fact, interestingly, is you can actually, um, Where's my training thing? It's in here somewhere. There it is. You can actually include I, custom icon sets in your themes. So you'll notice here, so I just created this training thing because when I'm training, uh, the font size of eight point font is never big enough. So I just have a training theme that de defaults all of my fonts to 11 point font. But notice that you can also specify an icon set. And here are these different icons that I have here. And when I apply that theme, so again, I just come in and say, I've already imported that theme. So I already did switch theme, import theme. But notice if I come here to US net sales and I come in, and I just say, buy icon set. And again, um, you can set these to numbers. But what, notice in that theme, everybody see that in here now? I, here are those GIFs that I included in my theme. So if you don't want to have to memorize, you know, uh, uh, or keep creating these uh, uh, references in measures, you can actually, as part of your theme now, reference your custom icon sets uh, and just have them available to you. Uh, so you can see I got like flames and a boom, and this is a walking cat and the little psychedelic spinny thing. So. Uh, I thought that was really, really neat. I had a lot of fun playing with that last night. Um, the ability to, to add in not only custom images, but custom GIFs as well that are actually animated. So I thought that was really kind of neat. So, um, so yeah, so that's, what the, that's the kind of thing that you can get by doing, uh, having fun with your icon sets. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, so if you got any questions on that, let me know. Um, but again, the, the way that you access it is you simply go to conditional formatting and you'll now have icons available. And then you set it just like you would do by rules for any other conditional formatting thing that you're trying to do. So um, that's how you do 
that. And I've seen some chats show up, so I will, um, let me just take a look here really quick and make sure I'm not missing anything. Let's see. So I see some things in there, but um, I'm going to walk, I'm going to go through my little use case here, and then I'll come back to these questions. So I can see some questions going on. I can see some things in the chat window. Uh, so I'll come back to those uh, here in a minute. Okay. Lastly, um, so the use case we want to talk about today is around fiscal dates. Uh, so uh, again, as, as I mentioned, as I'm, when I'm teaching class, um, a lot of times I'll get asked, well, how do you do, when we talk about time intelligence, that, you know, the question comes up, how do I, my fiscal year starts in October. How do I, you know, how do I do that? So here's my little life hack on how I do uh, fiscal dates. Um, it's actually a pretty simple hack. And the, the, the trick is really just around um, what I really want to do is if, for example, our, let's say our fiscal year started in October, right here, October 1st is in the calendar year 2015, but I want to, I want to say it's also in the fiscal year of 2016. So I want September 2015 to stay in the fiscal year of 2015, but on October 1st, I want my fiscal year to now start on 2016. How do I do that? Well, surprisingly, the fix is quite simple. Um, so in my date table, so this is a date table that I've, I've generated using some DAX, um, and uh, feel free to steal this if you want. Um, but the, the way that I do this is all I need to do is create a column that essentially increments in this case, my date forward, so that I can just uh, to a, to a dummy fiscal date, and I can just parse out the year uh, and quarter, and actually maybe the period number um, out of that new dummy date, so that it appears that this date which I'm slicing on is now in a new uh, period. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a new column uh, called fiscal date, and this this date. Uh, I'm, I'm going to hide, so I'm not even going to show this. Um, but all I want to do here is, because my fiscal date starts in October, I want October I, to, to uh, start by 2016. So all I need to do in this fiscal date is move this date forward three months. And I can do that really easily with my handy-dandy little date add function that just says, what date? Well, my date column and I want you to move it ahead three months, okay? So there's the code for my fiscal date. And again, I'm not gonna display this. I'm gonna hide this column eventually. All right, so there's my fiscal date column and the format doesn't matter. But now what I can do is I can now create another column and I can start parsing things off of this fiscal date. So I can say my fiscal year column is just the year of my fiscal date column. All right, and notice, again, this fiscal date column is going to be hidden. No one's going to use it. But if I come down and find 20, October in here somewhere, here's October 1st. This, here's my line right here. Notice here, October 1st is pinned to January, January 1st, 2016. So it appears as though, and then I can parse off that 2016 part, and now notice my fiscal year column starts on October 1st, whereas my fis fiscal year 2015 ends at the end of September. Perfect, that's exactly what I was hoping for. So now I can simply come in and I can say my fiscal quarter is simply, so to get the quarter, I just use the format function. So again, we're using the fiscal date column and I'm just gonna do, uh, We'll just do quarter and let's say two digit year, let's say. And maybe I want to stick the, the letters FQ in front of this. So I'll just do fiscal quarter like that. So there's fiscal quarter three, 2015. And I can even do my fiscal period if I want. I can do new column. So my fiscal period is simply just my, the month of my 
fiscal date. So October 1st is going to be in the first fiscal period, right? All right, so let's go check and see see what that did. Uh, so I'm going to come, here's, here's my, uh, I've just got this little table that starts on September 1st. And if I now bring in my fiscal year, fiscal quarter, and fiscal period, so sure enough, September 1st, so this is the column we care about, is in 2015, but it's quarter four of fiscal 2015. And here on October 1st is where my new fiscal year starts. This is exactly what I wanted. And now I can slice and dice. And if I come in and say, give me, let's create a quick slicer with fiscal year. And I don't want it to be a range. I want it to be a list. If I say fiscal year 2016, look at that starts on October 1st, 2015. It's exactly what I wanted. So now the fun thing is, so here's, we, we probably, most of you have probably seen the code, the time intelligence functions to do things like year to date, right? Um, so for example, here's the DAX for year to date. Uh, so very simple. Um, but what if I want to do fiscal year to date? Well, that's a little different ball of wax because I can't use my standard time intelligence functions because those presume a standard calendar that starts on January 1st and ends on December 31st. But it doesn't mean I'm, it doesn't mean I'm, I'm out of luck. Uh, I just have to write what I call old school DAX. So if I want to create a fiscal year, so if I want to call this sales fiscal year year to date, so it, I'm, so I'm going to say calculate. I'm going to do something something new. I'm going to calculate. Did I call it sales? I called it sales. So I just want sales. And then my filter condition. And so here, because I need to do some fun, fil uh, some more complex things than just simply adding context, I'm going to use the filter function. So I'm going to do a little more advanced kind of things. So the first thing I want to do is I need to get rid of, I need to clear any of the context applied to my date table. And the all function does that. So I'm just going to say, essentially, clear out my date table. And then sum up everything where, and I'm just going to say where my fiscal year, so here's my fiscal year, because year to date is same fiscal year, and then where the date is just less than the date that you're, or equal to the date you're looking at. So I can say fiscal year, so that's my inner loop, and then my outer is max of fiscal year. Double ampersand is the and function, or the and operator, beg your pardon. And I can just say that my date, let's not equal to max date. All right, that's good. Close off my filter, close off my calculate, enter. And always format, format, format. And if I did this right, that's a big yes. So I'm going to do a little knock on wood. If I add this guy into my table here. So now notice that as I'm coming along, so it's calculating my fiscal year to date, and look right here. On, on October 1st, it resets. My year to date keeps climbing. My fiscal year to date resets, starts climbing. And as we go, There we go. Keeps climbing, keeps climbing. Here on January 1st, my year to date, calendar year to date resets, but my fiscal year to date keeps climbing. So again, here is the code that I used for fiscal year to date. Quarter to date is the same code. You're just adding in an additional argument that says for your fiscal quarter equals the max of fiscal quarter. So again, if I wanted to do that really quick. Simply copy paste. I'll add in this new measure. Change this to a Q. And so all I need to do here is, is add again one additional argument that also checks the fiscal quarter. So fiscal quarter, fiscal quarter. So And format, don't forget to format your measures. 
always format your measures. If I add this guy into the table, see if that worked. So I can come in here. Fun with formats. Come on, get out of the way. Sometimes I get a little frustrated with that DAX formula bar. All right, so here my fiscal quarter to date is accruing through period one, period two, and period three. Come on. There we go. Oops. Sorry. I actually clicked on the header. Went I wanted to sort it. And my quarter to date, again, resets when I get to a new quarter, fiscal quarter. It also happens to reset during the calendar quarter as well. But those are some of the fun things that you can do uh, to work with fiscal uh, fiscal calendars. So if your calendar starts, if your fiscal calendar starts in July, like Microsoft, so July 1st, 2019 starts the 2020 fiscal year, your fiscal date column, you're just gonna increment ahead six months instead of three. And then again, I would, I always just hide this fiscal date because it doesn't mean anything. It's not used for anything other than to just generate this period, quarter, and year columns in my date table. That's the only thing it's used for. So that's how I solve fiscal, uh, 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 fiscal date problems in DAX. Uh, and there's probably other ways, you know, if, if, uh, if you've got some really complicated um, calendar problems, like if, you, if you're using 445 calendars and stuff like that, uh, the guys over at, at DaxPatterns.com, so uh, Marco Russo and Alberto Ferrari, they've got some great articles out there on how to do uh, time intelligence against 445 or week-based calendars. So you can check that out uh, on their site. Okay. So that was uh, uh, fiscal calendars in 13 minutes. So hopefully, uh, if you want, if you got any questions on that, let me know. Don't forget, uh, these sessions are recorded, uh, so you can always go back and check out, you know, what, any code that I wrote. Um, uh, you just gotta, uh, I think you just have to register on our website, and I promise you that that we don't spam you. So, um, so yeah, so you can definitely check out the recordings. Um, oh, if you if you're interested in any preview features to turn on or off any preview features, if if it's not obvious, you simply come to the file menu, options and settings, options, and this is where you can <clears throat> um, select which preview features you want to turn on or off. One other thing that that we recommend here at Blue Granite, back to our fiscal calendar things, um, is that if you're going to have a separate date table. So remember that the rule, if you're going to use any time intelligence functions, uh, the rule is you have to have a separate date dimension uh, with a contiguous set of dates. Uh, if you're going to have a separate date dimension, we, I recommend turning off this auto date hierarchy thing. It just creates some extra bloat behind the scenes. To turn that off, uh, it's a setting that you can either turn off globally or just for the current file. So for example, I can come into options and settings and come down to data load and it's this auto date time checkbox. And if I turn that off, it gets rid of that underlying date hierarchy, which I don't want because I've already created my own year, quarter and month column. So I don't need that underlying date hierarchy. And it just, uh, that auto date time for every date time, date or date time column in your entire model it's creating an underlying date table, which can sometimes cause a little bit of bloat. So uh, just a personal recommendation there. If you've got your own separate date dimension, go ahead and just turn off that auto date time uh, feature. Okay, so with that, I'm going to see if I can navigate. It's always a question if I, if I can figure out this questions box. So we only got a couple questions. Uh, so it seems wrong for formatting to ask twice about whether a value is ever percent. Yeah, I can't say I disagree with that. Um, uh, you would think that it would just be once per row. Um, but uh, I'm, yeah, not sure. But that's a, that's a 
a valid point right there, uh, Stephen. Um, uh, you probably wouldn't say if, if it's greater than this number and less than this percent, but what do I know? So uh, fair, fair point there. Uh, can you paste the DAX for the date table in the chat window? Sure. Um, come back here. So this is a little uh, DAX formula that I've, I've, I wrote and kind of keep up to date from time to time. Um, so what this does, let's just walk through it for a second. So this calendar auto function is one of my favorite functions. Uh, so calendar auto will scan every date, date time and time column in your model and get in and find the earliest date and go to January 1st of that year. Find the latest date and go to December 31st of that year and give you every date in between, um, which is fantastic until you start getting into cases where you, you maybe you have birthdays. So somebody's, you know, date of birth is in 1902. Um, you're going to get a calendar from January 1st, 1902 through today. Um, so uh, if, if you're really just looking at transactional data, data, this is a really handy function. If you need, if you want it to be dynamic, but maybe just looking at one or two specific date columns in your model, uh, there's other ways to do it back in M that I would probably, I would probably generate the table back in M. So this gives us a table, and then this add co this add columns function, just in name value pairs, just starts generating all of these different columns. So I've got year, and then I've got my year key, and so day of week, blah 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 blah. Uh, I actually come in and start calculating out some holidays like Memorial Day. Um, so uh, there's all sorts of different places that I went and, and got the date math to figure out like Labor Day, Memorial Day, and things like that. So I'll make sure that I give attribution in the blog post we do for this. Um, but that's what this whole mess does. So let me, let me grab this copy. Yeah, there's a chat window. There it is. Break this out. Paste that. Oh, I, I hit the limit. <laughs> so I apologize, but it's incomplete. Um, here is the very last bit of that. Um, we'll do from here to the end. So you just got to kind of mash these two together because I hit the limit of the chat window. So yeah, if you're if you're interested, you can do that. Um, I there's, cause I also have it in a flat file, but I don't know that I can attach a file to the chat window. Okay. Let's see if we got any other, okay. No other questions. Um, trying to think if there's anything else interesting to, um, show you guys. I had a, um, I saw a question on uh, one of the user groups talking about uh, trying to do month over month analysis. Um, and <clears throat> again, th these time intelligence functions, if you haven't used them, uh, are really, really handy. Um, so I'll give you a, another fun little thing that that'll work regardless if you're in a fiscal calendar or just a calendar calendar. Um, but there, these time intelligence functions make things like month over month analysis really, really easy. Um, so uh, sales prior month, given that you've got a separate date table, is really this easy. It's just simply uh, calculate whatever you want to calculate in this turn in this case sales, and it's as simple as previous month and your date table. It's that quick. I love these time intelligence functions. Whoops! I, apparently, I already coded that one up. I did. Um, let's get this to number two. And I think if I come back over here, yeah, that's what I was doing on this duplicate page too. And it's really just that fast and easy. So you can see here, here's my sales by month. And then if I, this one's just looking back a month. So then month over month growth, right, is simply sales month over month growth is simply uh, sales minus sales prior month. Don't forget to format your measures, Eric. Where to go? So here's month over month growth. Bang, that easy. And then your growth percentage is simply, and we've I think we talked about this in the past. 
is we, we recommend using the divide function. What does the divide function do? It traps and divide by zero errors. So this is just my growth divided by my prior month. Format it. One of the things that I do when I'm creating calculated measures is I, I always have the modeling menu up and I instantly format it the minute I create it. That way I don't have to go back and keep doing it. And there you go. So prior month is just that easy. So And, and I, I am in the habit of, I like to create mine in constituent parts so that um, I can go back and if, if I need to debug something, I can see all the, the different things that it's doing. But that is, uh, that's month over month. Uh, some people try to use the quick measure to do that, and it, I just find the quick measure sometimes a little finicky. So I just prefer to, to uh, write the DAX myself. Okay, let's, do I have any other? Ah, here they come. Okay. Uh, any advice for Power BI embedding? So, so Sean, I'm going to guess, so when you mean app embeds, it, says, it looks like you're trying to do using Python. So I'm guessing you're meaning using Python as a source. Um, so if I have that wrong, Sean, uh, ping me in the, in, in the questions window. Uh, but you can use, not only can you use R and Python as a source, you can also use them as <clears throat> data cleansing tools. Uh, so the first thing you have to do is install R and or Python. Um, so installing them locally. So I happen to have Microsoft Open R installed on my machine and Python. Then you have to tell Power BI where those installs live. So under options and settings and options again, in here is where you're now going to point Power BI to your R install or your Python install. Once you've done that, you then have the ability in the query editor to both, um, if I click new source, not only could I use an existing, if I come down to other, not only could I use an existing R script or Python script as the data source, but I can also use them as data cleansing scripts as well. And what I should do is I should see if, if somebody here at Blue Granite has a good working example of it using them in M. Because you also have the R and Python visualizations. We've got a good demo of that out on our website. Um, so if you have an R script that you just want to use uh, to visualize the data, you can just drop you can just drop the R, R visualization on the page or the Python visualization, and then just take the Python code and copy paste, and you're off and running. Uh, so you can do that on the visualization side as well. So, Sean, I hope that answered your question. If I didn't, scream. Um, let me check the chat window really quick to make sure I'm not missing anything here. No, it doesn't look like it. Check the question window. Oh, um, yeah, in terms of within web pages, um, I am not familiar with the Python interface when, when you're embedding it within a web page. Um, I'm only familiar with it using the C-sharp JavaScript method. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, that is, you've, you've stumped the chump. I'll have to ask some of the folks around here. Um, we do, we help clients with, with embedding here, but I know that we do it primarily the, the C-sharp MVC or JavaScript way. Uh, so I don't know that we've ever done the, the Python thing. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, the embedding, uh, just to do a little bit of shameless self-promotion, um, on our website, so blue-granite.com, I believe if you simply search for embed, I think it's the first one that comes up. Uh, Brian DeZue wrote this article. It, no, there it is. So the second one down, I believe, is the proper one. This is Brian's article, and he actually walks you through. So he does MVC code, so ASP.NET stuff. 
uh, and he gives you the code. Uh, and then he talks about, um, you know, how to embed, how does security work, da 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 da. da. So, um, Brian's one of our Uber geeks here, so he's really, really smart. He also does a lot of our custom uh, visualization development. So that's a really great article for you to check out um, if you're interested in learning more about embedding. And again, this is also where you can come to go grab. Uh, if you come to, on our website, if you come to the events page, and I think it's, if, if you follow the link to the Power BI office hours, I believe it's in here. Ah, yep, here's the link to your, our recorded sessions. So if you want to go back and look at uh, to either view this session again or view prior sessions, this is where you come in and you can get to that uh, sort of stuff. There's a lot of really, really great content out here on our website for not just Power BI, but things like machine learning and AI, um, uh, data visualization best practices. We've got industry case studies. So a lot of really, really great content out here on our, on our website. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll hang out for another 60 seconds to see if any other questions pop up. Um, I don't think that I missed any. Just kind of going through the... Um, otherwise, uh, if there aren't any other questions, um, I will uh, will give you guys 10 minutes back of your day. Um, but thanks again, everybody, for, uh, for those of you who, who attended today. Hope you found it valuable. Um, again, if you've got any questions, uh, give me a holler. Um, my email address is here at the bottom. Uh, if I'm not on the road teaching, I'm usually pretty good at getting back to you. If I'm on the road teaching, I'm usually pretty bad about it. So, um, uh, but definitely shoot me any of any questions you've got. I'll help out if I can. Um, we're planning on the next uh, next session to be August 22nd, so four weeks from today. Um, if you've got a specific use case that you'd like to see or have us revisit one, uh, definitely let us know and um, we will try to uh, uh, customize this to exactly what you guys are, uh, are looking for. So, um, uh, can you import data and live link data in the same Power BI workbook? Uh, so, so the answer is yes. It's, the, it's, a, it's a, so, the answer is yes. Uh, it, it's the the feature is called a composite model, but you can't use it with live connection to analysis services. It only works with with direct query connections. So, for example, direct querying your SQL Server data. Um, but it's it's the feature called composite models, and it allows you to direct query connect to say really large underlying data sets, and yet mash them up with maybe an imported Excel sheet. Um, so. Uh, so this is the, the the Microsoft doc on composite models, uh, and they walk you through uh, exactly how to do it. But this is again, this allows you to direct connect using direct query to uh, maybe your underlying SQL Server data, and then import maybe a flat file and mash the two together. Uh, so that's so you can absolutely support that. Again, it does not support live connections to analysis services. Although I heard a nasty rumor that that might be coming. I don't know when. I don't even know if that rumor is true. Um, but composite models is the feature uh, that you're looking for there. Whoops, I opened the wrong window. Sorry. So Greg, hopefully, cool. Good, good, good. Okay, so I will stick around for you know another sixty seconds to see if uh, if anybody else has any other questions. Um, and again, after the call, don't don't feel bashful on sending me emails. Uh, if you've got other questions, uh, we want to help you help everybody be successful in the Power BI journeys. Um, so uh, definitely give us a shout. And again, uh, you know, Blue Granite, um, you know, we do. If you're interested in learning about Power BI training. Uh, we do a lot of Power BI training for our clients. We do a lot of Power BI development for our clients uh, on top of the sort of bread and butter Azure data warehousing AI work that we do uh, for our clients. So if you're interested in any of that, uh, let me know, and I will absolutely put you in touch with 
uh, the right folks. Uh, otherwise, I will give everybody uh, now eight minutes back. So I uh, hope you found it valuable. Have a great uh, rest of your Thursday and a great weekend. And we will talk with everybody on August 22nd. Thanks, everyone.